test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, this is Heather Hyman from Maryland Volunteer Lawyer Service. Um, we still have a bunch of people joining the webinar, so we'll get started in another minute or two. Thanks again for joining us today. All right. Hello, everyone. I think we are going to get going. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for an introduction to human trafficking and a discussion about how human trafficking laws and interactions with the criminal justice system can impact survivors. Um, this webinar that you're attending today is part of a regular series hosted by Maryland Volunteer Lawyer Service, which is the largest statewide pro bono service provider that connects low-income Marylanders with free legal, civil legal services. And this presentation is also part of the Human Trafficking Prevention Project, which is a partnership between the University of Baltimore School of Law and MVLS that offers representation to trafficking survivors who are looking to set aside or vacate their prostitution convictions, as well as to survivors and individuals who are at risk of future exploitation who might need help with criminal record expungement, shielding, um, or with a whole host of other civil legal services, including family law help, housing issues, consumer debt or bankruptcy assistance, tax controversies, and help with other legal matters. So I am excited to have here today um, my colleague, Jessica Emerson, who is the director of the Human Trafficking Prevention Project from University of Baltimore. Um, we'll be going back and forth discussing things today. I'll let you say hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. <laughs> we'll be going back and forth discussing everything today, um, and we're excited to have you with us. Please note that um, you can submit questions during the webinar. We'll be keeping an eye on the little question tab on the taskbar. Um, so feel free to jump in if you have questions and we'll take moments throughout the webinar to pause and answer anything you might want to ask. Um, this webinar is also being recorded, so you should be able to view it on the MVLS website once we've concluded, um, given like some of a day or two to get it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the agenda for today, um, you know, first we're going to be talking about an overview of human trafficking laws, looking at both the federal, state, and state level, and looking at what laws can both provide benefits to or negatively impact survivors. Um, we'll then be turning to the criminalization of human trafficking and really look at the collateral consequences of having a criminal record and how that can prevent people from moving forward with their lives in safety. And then the third part of the presentation, we'll be talking about why post-conviction relief is so important for survivors of trafficking. And just a quick note, this webinar is actually the first in a three-part series. Um, in August, Jessica and I will be coming back together again to discuss um, uh, filing for vacature here in Maryland. And then later in the fall, we'll have a webinar that's focusing on expungement. So you can kind of, as a, this this three-part series get a real, really full picture of the collateral consequences of involvement in the criminal justice system and what remedies we can access to assist survivors. So with that, I am going to hand it off to Jessica to get started with some federal law. <laughs> Great. Um, again, uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jessica Emerson, and I am the director of the Human Trafficking Prevention Project at University of Baltimore School of Law. I um, just want to say thank you, as always, to MBLS for their partnership in this project and also um, for their gracious um, handling of all the technology so I don't have to do it. Uh, so. 
when we talk about what is human trafficking, primarily what you need to know is that it's a crime. It's a crime that's defined at the international level, at the federal level, and at the state level. Um, as of many years ago, every single state in the United States has some form of law on the books that criminalizes human trafficking. It involves compelled service across a variety of labor sectors um, and includes trafficking into both the commercial sex trade as well as trafficking into other forms of labor. Okay. Uh, the kind of broadest understanding of human trafficking law can be found in the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, or the TVPA. This was the first comprehensive piece of federal legislation uh, that um, addressed human trafficking, and it emerged on the heels of a case that's called the El Monte case, um, where federal authorities were summoned essentially to a, a sweatshop where there were Thai nationals, what we now know, were being trafficked for labor. Um, but at the time, in 1998-99, we didn't have law to define what was happening to them as a crime. And so essentially they were shuttled into the immigration system um, and kind of queued up for deportation. Um, and there were some organizations that provided relief, but essentially what we figured out around this time was that this, what happened here, we don't have crime, we don't have any kind of criminal laws to define it, but we know that this was a crime. Um, and so that kind of put everything into the works uh, to get the TVPA passed. It was first enacted in the year 2000, has been subsequently reauthorized most recently uh, this year, in 2019. It contains the human trafficking legal definitions. It contains criminal provisions to prosecute traffickers, immigration protection, civil remedies, and victim benefits. So the, the way that the TVPA defines severe forms of trafficking in persons is that they bifurcate it into sex and labor trafficking. Sex trafficking is defined as using what's called force, fraud, or coercion, and we will further define those terms because those are the most important terms to understand when you're thinking about what human trafficking is, um, to recruit, harbor, transport, provide, obtain, patronize, or solicit a person for a commercial sex act, or, and that or is really important, in which the person performing the act is under the age of 18. What that or means is that anybody under federal law any person who is under the age of 18, so 17 and under, any minors engaging in a commercial sex act, trading sex or a sex act for something of value, money, um, shelter, uh, food, drugs, um, those individuals are per se defined as victims of trafficking under federal law. Now it's worth noting that there is an, an inconsistency in between a lot of state laws, including Maryland mm -hmm. and the federal law, where federal law says that a minor engaging in a commercial sex act is a victim of trafficking, but um, in Maryland, um, survivors can still be uh, prosecuted for prostitution on the state level, but that's a whole nother webinar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, labor trafficking is defined again by that forced part of coercion, using forced part of coercion to recruit, harbor, transport, or obtain a person for labor or service, services in involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. Um, and that is the definition of trafficking under federal law. So I mentioned that the TVPA also contains the provisions to prosecute traffickers. Um, there are more than what are indicated here, but we're just gonna give you kind of an over overview. Um, the forced labor statute, 18 USC 1589, it refers to the crime of providing or obtaining the labor or services of a person, again, through force, fraud, or coercion. And again, we'll, we will uh, de further define those terms in a few slides. The sex trafficking statute is 18 USC 1591. It refers to the sex trafficking of children or of adults by force, fraud, or coercion. Again, simply engaging in a commercial sex act for a 17-year-old or younger is considered per se to be human trafficking. And that's why you don't have to prove that somebody was forced, defrauded, or coerced into doing so. And so that's the, the legal distinction there. There's also kind of a general trafficking statute, 18 USC 1590, and this criminalizes a broader range of actions than providing or obtaining labor. It includes the recruitment, the harboring, or the transporting of victims. So this allows for someone who is involved in the forced labor of someone, but is not doing the forcing, defrauding, or coercing, um, they could be charged under 1590. 
There's also document servitude. I think that's pretty self-explanatory, um, just involves uh, someone's documents and using those to uh, effectuate a trafficking crime. Um, and the US TVPA also criminalizes attempt. So even if the, uh, the, the trafficking is not done, uh, attempt is criminalized as well through 18 USC 1592 and 1594. Now the TVPA also has provisions for restitution and civil relief for um, trafficking survivors. And it's interesting, um, you know, under the TVPA, traffickers must, you can see the word must M be used. We should italicize <laughs> We should italicize time. or bold it. <laughs> must be ordered to pay for the full amount of the victim's losses resulting from the trafficking. I mean, this is really a critical provision. And unfortunately, it's something that does not um, often happen, I think, especially in sex trafficking cases. Um, and this is calculated as the greater of the gross income or value to the defendant of the victim's services or labor, or in, there's a lot of words, value of the victim's labor is guaranteed under the minimum wage and overtime guarantees of the Fair Labor Standards Act. We never said Congress was not verbose. Yeah. But unpacking this, what does this mean? I mean, you can, you know, look at lost wages based on a contract, look at minimum wages, look at overtime pay in that sector. Um, you can calculate you know, this monetary amount that a survivor should be entitled to. And um, this can be a little bit more challenging with sex trafficking cases, mm -hmm. though. Um, I think that, you know, people can be uncomfortable naming sex acts, let alone talking about the cost of certain sex acts, mm -hmm. or looking at their frequency and trying to calculate, you know, what a person should be entitled to. This can also be really, really challenging, and people will shy away from it if it's a minor who's a survivor. So um, this is, you know, this is a problem, though, because generally people that haven't, you know, um, been sex trafficked are not getting restitution when they should be. Um, prosecutors don't ask for it. And this is where advocates, I think, really need to step up Absolutely. and advocate on behalf of the individual that they're working with so that um, they can get restitution on the survivor's behalf and can have it ordered as part of the sentence against the trafficker. Um, there's also civil damages that are available, and this was added by a later authorization, reauthorization of the TVPA. Um, and this basically allows um, victims to bring a civil case against their trafficker and anyone else who knowingly benefited from um, what was done against them. And here there doesn't need to be a federal case brought against the trafficker. Um, this can really let survivors get compensation for other types of damages as well, for like pain and suffering, for get, you know, help with getting counseling and a, a wider range of things. And you don't have that, again, requirement that a federal case is being brought against the trafficker. Right. And the real key here is that the restitution piece is about the labor, mm -hmm. the amount of what they would have earned if they were working legally. Mm -hmm. And the civil damages, like you said, is everything else. Mm -hmm. um, there's an organization in D.C., the Human Trafficking Pro Bono Legal Center. They are the uh, Martina Vandenberg. Yes, they are yes. the preeminent <laughs> center. If you want to know anything about restitution and civil damages, go on over to their website. They actually have a number of really um, helpful and informative uh, reports on this. Mm -hmm. I think I think restitution and civil reason has, falls into a similar you know idea as with um, dealing with collateral consequences of criminal convictions. It's one of those things when we're trying to assist survivors that you often are trying to kind of handle their emergency needs. And then down the road, there's things that still could be addressed and be of enormous benefit to them, but it can get, yeah. get lost sometimes. I think it's that. And also we have as a country prioritized um, as anti-trafficking policy, putting traffickers in jail, yes. which is, I understand, mm -hmm. <laughs> we understand. But I think, unfortunately, we sometimes forget that there is the aftermath. And mm -hmm. this is a piece of that, as is the work mm -hmm. that we do with the Human Trafficking Prevention Project. Exactly. So there's some other forms of victim benefits, too. Um, specifically, there's, there's a whole provision of the TVPA that can assist foreign nationals who are victims of severe forms of trafficking. Um, and there's a lot of different things that, that these individuals, these survivors, can access. I think one of the things that's most well known is just getting basic immigration relief, getting a T visa, um, which gives survivors a temporary status for up to four years in the United States. And it gives them also the possibility of adjusting to permanent resident status here and staying in the country. Um, you know, there's some requirements around this though. Adult survivors have to be willing to comply with any reasonable requests made by law enforcement that's related to the investigation or prosecution of their trafficker, 
which can be a hurdle for some survivors. Yeah. And you know, the, uh, minor survivors do not need to do this. Um, there's also a trauma exception for adults, but this can be complicated. And um, we're actually going to have another webinar coming up this fall that will dive deeper into the intersection of human trafficking um, and immigration um, and focus on some of the, the recent developments under the current administration that have you know, set up more hurdles for survivors. Um, but you can see there's a big list of benefits that foreign nationals can access. Um, and uh, one important caveat is that adults do have to get certified by, um, by the HHS to be able to receive the benefits where child victims do not. Um, and it can again present another hurdle, this bureaucracy to accessing benefits that can really help survivors. So now we're going to turn to Maryland trafficking laws, and um, we're going to provide an overview of them. But I know Jessica is going to throw in some caveats because there have been some updates over the last year, given the last yes. general ses uh, assembly session down in Annapolis. Yes. <laughs> so um, the, the first thing that I want to highlight is that. Unfortunately, there is still a rumor that is uh, perpetuated, unfortunately, through uh, a lot of advocacy organizations that human trafficking is only a misdemeanor in the state of Maryland. If you ever hear that, please tell them that Jessica Emerson says you are wrong <laughs> <laughs> because it is legally incorrect. Um, in the state of Maryland, there is both misdemeanor and felony human trafficking. Um, at this point, uh, so like Heather said, laws are going to change pretty significantly um, in October, but at this point we are going to train you on what the law says now, um, but we think this provides um, a good opportunity in October when these laws do change for an update on what the new laws actually say. Mm -hmm. Right now, um, misdemeanor human trafficking is actually codified within the prostitution subtitle of the uh, Maryland Criminal Code, which is problematic uh, because it perpetuates the myth that only sex trafficking is trafficking. Um, and also, human trafficking is not a prostitution crime. It is a crime against a person that sometimes involves prostitution. Um, but at this point, that's where the laws are. In October, the human trafficking law is finally going to move out of the prostitution subtitle into the crimes against persons subtitle where it should be. Um, but at this point, like I said, this is where it is. So misdemeanor human trafficking refers to the trafficking of an adult. Um, and there is no need under Maryland law to prove force, fraud, or coercion. Um, that can be really problematic or it, it is problematic. Um, because Maryland's human trafficking law, as it currently stands, criminalizes things that are not trafficking. But again, we're simply going to train you on what the law says now. So trafficking of an adult, no need to prove that forced fraud or coercion uh, took place. Um, instead, simply transporting someone somewhere, knowing that they're going to engage in the, uh, the crime of prostitution, um, is trafficking. Um, and the fine for that is incarceration not exceeding 10 years and a fine not exceeding $5,000 or both. Um, like I said, if anyone tells you that there is not felony human trafficking in the state of Maryland, you can tell them that they are wrong and that they can come to me with any questions. <laughs> um, felony human trafficking is divided into two pieces. One is the trafficking of a minor. There's no need to prove force, fraud, or coercion. If there's a, a, a trafficking case brought and there's a minor involved, that person is automatically going to be charged with felony human trafficking. Um, you also can be charged with felony human trafficking of an adult, but in the criminal case, there would have to be some offer of proof that force, fraud, or coercion was used to get the person to engage um, in the commercial sex act. And felony human trafficking bumps up the punishment significantly, incarceration not exceeding 25 years, uh, a fine not exceeding 15,000 or both. Um, interestingly enough, the felony trafficking subsection referring to adults, B2, doesn't actually refer to sex trafficking right now. Um, it is missing a reference to the commercial aspect of uh, the crime where there is the trading of sex for something of value. That has is being fixed, I should say, um, and will actually refer to a commercial sex act come October. Um, but at this point right now, it doesn't. And then also there's really no labor trafficking law, which is um, again, you know, an unfortunate 
perpetuation of the myth that sex trafficking is the only form of trafficking mm -hmm. that counts. Um, that's changing as well in October. So, so just to clarify, so right now that trafficking of adults the, under the felony human trafficking mm -hmm. statute it basically just criminalizes rape in a way, <laughs> <Yes>. right? <It laughs> doesn't, because there isn't that language about the commercial aspect. Right. It's it's kind of missing the whole point of the trafficking statute. <laughs> yes, uh, it's that, and also it criminalizes forced marriage, which mm -hmm. is a separate crime mm -hmm. and will be its own crime. Mm -hmm. Um, in October. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the statute's really kind of a mess, mm -hmm. for lack of a better way to put it. That's why in my uh, work with students, when I train on this, I put human trafficking in quotation marks yes. for right here. Well, and we can, again, we are, we're looking forward to offering some clarity on this yes. when the law actually changes in October with a follow-up webinar that'll unpack what these changes are and how these new laws will hopefully better serve survivors here in Maryland. <laughs> and also, uh, you know, really support what trafficking actually is as mm -hmm. opposed to what it is not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so we just have a little caveat. Maryland law will change in October of this year. OK, some additional laws for you to be aware of. Um, there is the courts and judicial proceedings law that focuses on what sexual abuse is. So in 2012, the definition of sexual abuse was changed to include the sex trafficking of a child. Before that, trafficking, sex trafficking of a child was not considered a form of sexual abuse. Um, we actually expanded that in 2017. The definition of sexual abuse was expanded to include sex trafficking of a child by any individual. Um, the challenge that a lot of advocates working with minors were having was that prior to 2017, if I, if, there, if I came across a minor who had a trafficker and the trafficker, they were living with that trafficker, that wasn't necessarily considered sexual abuse because it wasn't somebody who was acting as a parent to that mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. And so now the definition has expanded. So anyone trafficking a child, that is considered sexual abuse. Um, it also allows for all youth who trade sex, even if they don't have a trafficker, to be deemed a child in need of assistance, making them eligible to receive services. Because, like I said, before 2017, if somebody was acting, if a trafficker was acting in a parental role, that wasn't considered sexual abuse because the parent, parental figure wasn't doing the trafficking. But also a 15-year-old who is homeless mm -hmm. out on the streets trading sex for survival was not eligible to receive services in the state in the same way that a child with a an identifiable trafficker was able to do. Um, so this just really kind of improved services for these very vulnerable young folks. I feel like a lot of these laws are changing, and even with the legislative changes that happened this year, just as you know, practitioners are working and advocates are working with clients, you begin to see these weird gaps. holes and yep. gaps and contradictions in the law. And so it's just this constant process to try and improve things. Yes, yeah. so. and unpack it. And, and we really do, to, to toot the horn of Maryland, have some great legislative advocates um, uh, through the Maryland Human Trafficking Task Force as well as partnering agencies. Mm -hmm. So I think we've done a great job of that. <laughs> um, a couple of other laws to be aware of. In 2011, Maryland passed a law that allows survivors of human trafficking to petition a court to vacate or set aside a conviction for prostitution that resulted from their trafficking experience. Um, we have been unsuccessful in updating that law um, unfortunately, and, and, and failed to do so in this latest um, legislative session. It is worth noting that um, there is a report that highlights how all 50 states do on this uh, criminal record relief laws in their in their states. Maryland received a solid uh, low F, I would say. Um, <laughs> the lowest of the F. Lowest of class the F. rank in Maryland F minus. was at the end. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Maryland desperately needs to update this, and we're hopeful to be able to do so in the next legislative session. Um, there is also a provision of the human trafficking law that will translate or transfer, I should say, to the new laws in October um, that says it is not a defense to a prosecution for trafficking of a minor that the defendant didn't know the age of the victim. Prior to 2013, I could, as a trafficker, simply say I thought she was 21. Um, and in 2013, the law changed so that that was not a legal, a legally viable defense mm -hmm. to uh, felony trafficking. 
Um, there is also in 2015, uh, Maryland amended its prostitution statute to allow for someone being charged with prostitution to assert that at the time that they committed that act or acts, they were the victim of human trafficking. Now, this has been a very useless law, I would say, because um, the legislature changed the language at the very last minute um, and basically said that in order to um, use this law, the survivor's trafficker had to be charged with trafficking in Maryland. And that's not what we advocated for. We advocated for this law for someone who doesn't know their trafficker's full name or the trafficker is halfway to Georgia by now. Mm -hmm. Um, this is another law that is thankfully going to be changed as of October, um, and anyone can use this defense um, if they are charged with prostitution. It's not that limited. So another good change to come out of the legislative session. So now we want to dive a little bit deeper into some of the language that's really at the heart of a lot of these human trafficking laws, and that's defining forced fraud and coercion. Um, these are really critical you know, legal terms mm -hmm. that you have to meet to be able to um, qualify as a survivor of human trafficking under federal and under Maryland law, um, under many of the statutes that we've discussed. So uh, first looking at force, um, you know, force can include physical abuse, sexual abuse, isolation, confinement. I think the crux of it really is that something is being done to the survivor. Um, and this is usually the, the, the type of violence that I think gets the most attention when you're thinking about human trafficking cases. Um, it's the basis for movies, publicity campaigns, there's pictures of... Here's looking at you, Law & Order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, sensational images of somebody being chained in a basement. Um, and that's not to minimize it. Many human trafficking survivors experience severe physical and sexual abuse and are isolated and confined when they're being trafficked. Um, but there are also other types of deceptions, threats, and exploitative practices that um, can really impact survivors. That and I think are far more common. Yes, and that are much more common. Um, so the second term that we want to look at a little more closely is the idea of fraud. And this can be false promises of employment, education, a better life, or, you know, promises around romance or the idea of being able to get married. Um, and, you know, th this can... This is often, you can define it as almost like a classic bait and switch, mm -hmm. right? Someone's promising X and then the person goes, takes certain steps and then find out they're really in Y situation that is totally not what they expected. Um, I think this can, you know, really be true often in cases involving foreign nationals. Um, you know, when people are brought over, say they're told they're going to be a, a nanny or a housekeeper or engage in whatever type of work. And um, the reality of the situation is that they're, they're not being given this type of work. They're going to be put in an exploitive situation. They're having their resources, documents mm -hmm. taken away from them. They're being isolated. They aren't able to communicate with their loved ones where they've come from. Um, they basically you know, are, are trapped away from their support networks and then get exploited. Um, and we also see, like with the promise of romance and marriage, um, with some of the work that I used to do was focusing on um, individuals that were exploited through the international marriage broker industry. And I think with the rise of the internet, it leads to a little bit more of this type of fraud, like people being offered that, you know, you can be, a, you should be a model and then suddenly they're tricked into some kind of other situation where they're being exploited. Or we see, you know, people reaching out overseas to try and find romantic partners and mm -hmm. the situation of the person that they're, um, you know, corresponding with is really nothing like what's presented online. Um, so there's been kind of a, I think, a growth in this type of deception and this type of situation facing human trafficking survivors. And I think, you know, this, this tactic is also commonly used against people who are living in poverty, too, and who are looking for a better life. And um, so, again, it's something that, that is a tactic used to prey on the most marginalized people. Um, and then the final uh, type of of tactic used by traffickers is coercion. And you can see the definition, um, and I, I, you know, the, the, the couple examples of definitions underneath coercion. And I just want to say that I think this is actually really, really common, probably the most common. And it can be really the most effective method of control. You know, clients that I've worked with have said that it wasn't really threats against themselves that made them feel like they had to stay in a situation. It was threats against their children, other loved ones, um, you know, their families that made them feel like they couldn't leave. Um, and I think it's also very common that, you know, traffickers will really just try to find out what a person needs and then fulfill that need. 
And it can be a relationship, it could be housing, it could be drugs, it could be other types of support, emotional support. And this can be one of the hardest things to prove, too, from a legal standpoint. Um, uh, but it's really important when you're dealing with someone who's faced coercion to really dive in deep into that individual's story and understand their circumstances and how a trafficker exploited and manipulated certain things to keep them under their control. Yeah. And I think you see this a lot in cases against traffickers, right? Mm -hmm. Because if I can prove that somebody was being held against their will, or I can show, you know, a jury who has seen too much law and order, <laughs> that somebody who has been physically or sexually abused, that's one thing, but everybody, you can't help it. You come into a situation with your own understanding of, you know, what, what would have to happen to me for mm -hmm. me to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And people can't necessarily take those lenses off, those glasses off, right? And so, you know, coercion, um, you know, to one person is not coercive to someone else. And so it's, it's really hard. Um, it's a hard job for prosecutors, you know, to kind of get these coercive centered cases mm -hmm. to have people understand that it doesn't matter what it would have meant to you. It matters legally what it meant to that person mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And that's, again, where I think working with the client to really outline the full arc of their story and show a slow mm -hmm. buildup of things that has that really you know made them feel like they couldn't leave a situation or like they were entirely reliant on the trafficker that maybe wasn't as obvious as again being physically abused or you know right. it more involves something subtler more subtle threats and um, right. that's really the role that advocates have to play right. to help develop that story and also to kind of break down some of those stigmas mm -hmm. right you know so if somebody has a certain feeling about somebody who is street-based homeless or, mm -hmm. or an opinion about um, what it means to be addicted to drugs and alcohol, right? That is going to get applied to the judgments made about someone using those very things to mm -hmm. exploit someone. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So who's most at risk of trafficking? Um, you know, anyone, and I want to emphasize this, anyone can be a target. Um, this is something that affects every community, you know, every population across our country around the world. Um, you know, again, traffickers are often looking for very specific individual vulnerabilities um, when they're targeting people. But there are certain populations that I think do get targeted more often. Um, and those, we consider those to be some more high risk groups. Um, so you'll see the list here, you know, women, individuals with history of se sexual abuse or assault, immigrants who with, um, that are dealing with substance use or abuse issues, and then youth, people that are, you know, have run away and are homeless, street-based, um, individuals from the LGBTQ AI community. <laughs> adding Did all you the learn letters. That from the other yeah, <laughs> yeah I, know, I, I always want to add all the letters. And anyone who's had child welfare involvement. Um, and you know, this list may seem very broad, but it, it's worth unpacking a little bit. You know, women are are more at risk for things like domestic violence, sexual assault, employment discrimination. And those are all things that can heighten one's vulnerability to future exploitation. If somebody has a history of sexual abuse or assault, um, I think you know, traffickers often know how to really leverage that guilt and shame and stigma that accompanies that experience. Um, and they look for other other types of vulnerabilities. For example, with immigrant groups, individuals who might not have that legal status here in this country or who might have language barriers that would prevent them from easily asking for help or who are unfamiliar with U.S. laws and protections that can also increase individuals' risk of exploitation. Um, with substance abuse, Jessica, always brings up an interesting point that I think is really worth reiterating about that. I think sometimes people have the conception that, oh, you know, a trafficker is giving drugs to mm -hmm. try to keep control over a person. Really um, easy to understand. Yeah, <laughs> easy to understand. You know, you know, the traffickers are filling a need by getting person drugs, and that's how they keep them under their control. But I know that there's been also cases we've seen where individuals have actually gotten support from the trafficker to get clean, to yep. get off of drugs. And the trafficker is providing this incredibly powerful support that they haven't received from anyone else and then that is what's being used as a form of coercion and control right. to keep them um, engaged in whatever they're engaged in at the behest of the trafficker um, 
And just a, you know, a note about youth, um, these different categories we have up here, oftentimes, you know, youth that are facing any of these issues or identify as LGBTQ+, they might not have the supports that other children have in place and that that can really make them a little bit more vulnerable to exploitation. They might not have strong adults in their lives. They might, um, you know, have kind of been pushed out of their families or be living again on the street and just struggling with basic survival. Or they might not have families that are supportive if there's already been child welfare involvement and that bouncing around from foster care to you know, foster care placement or um, you know, not having an anchor in their life can really open them up to future exploitation. And that is where, because we always kind of seem to say, well, this is where an advocate can be of such help. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we call our project the Human Trafficking Prevention Project because we want to prevent um, additional or new exploitation. You know, that's really the way that working with runaway and homeless youth, working with LGBTQ youth, working mm -hmm. with kids in the child welfare system, mm -hmm. by potentially being that anchor, mm -hmm. you are preventing trafficking. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, when I when I talk about, um, you know, people wanting to get involved in legislation and policy things, you have to get involved with these groups now mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and not just focus on, you know, changing human trafficking laws. Mm -hmm. When you do, you know, advocacy for immigrant groups, when you work on changing punitive, um, you know, drug abuse laws, you are doing human trafficking prevention mm -hmm. because you are making people less vulnerable. And it really is, is a way that I, I wish the anti-trafficking movement would move. And I think we are moving that way in the state of Maryland. And I'd add to this, just one last comment on this slide too, you know, this is encapsulated by our entire presentation, but I think also anyone that has struggled with um, or that has been arrested or convicted of crimes in the past sets them up to being absolutely in a more high risk group. Because if you cannot, due to your criminal record, access employment, if you cannot access housing, if you cannot access many of the benefits that are often needed, again, to move forward with your life and safety, you're vulnerable to future exploitation. And that's something that this project is trying to address. So now we're going to turn to um, some myths that we need to talk about. Um, oh, and there are way more than what we have. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have a short list and we're going to go through them one by one. But um, these are some things that I think it's very important to keep in mind and to, again, kind of check your own judgment and your own perceptions when you're working with people that are potential survivors of, of human trafficking, whether or not they identify as such. So one of the first myths that's out there is that victims see their traffickers as bad people. And this is just kind of painfully not true in every case. And we really need to, again, hold our judgment about what a victim's experience might be. Um, so, you know, survivors might have been trafficked by someone that they were in a relationship with, um, someone who cared for them, someone who provided support in ways that they really needed at the time. And they may have a bond and care about that individual, love, love <laughs> that individual. Um, we cannot assume that a survivor's trafficking experience was the worst experience in their life because it it likely may not have been. I um, mean, that's something yeah. to just keep in mind the entire time you're working with a survivor. Um, another myth is that all traffickers are, and we put in quotes because we do not like this word, <laughs> pimps. <laughs> um, you know, this word pimp, it, it means nothing legally. Um, it first. Just, <laughs> yeah, first, first and foremost, it means, it means nothing. nothing legally. It just perpetuates a myth of blackmail criminality that I think is very pervasive in our culture. And it also creates a really narrow view of who can be a trafficker. I mean, the, the just like anyone can be a target of trafficking, anyone can be a trafficker and people can be trafficked by a romantic partner, you know, a, a spouse, a priest, a lawmaker, someone who is a professional, like th this can happen. In, if, so many people can perpetuate this type of behavior and be victimized by this. And I think that, you know, the thing that, the way that this impacts our work, and you can tell me if you agree with me, is that we have to do so much educating mm -hmm. people that, yeah, if this person, this person's trafficker doesn't quote unquote identify as a, a, a pimp or doesn't mm -hmm. use some of that stereotypical language and, you know, that these that this still is trafficking mm -hmm. and it really, really impacts uh, survivors' access to justice. Mm -hmm. If they don't, quote unquote, look 
like what a real human trafficking victim is because they don't have a pimp. Mm -hmm. And so we just really as advocates have to think about like, what are we perpetuating when we choose to use certain language? Mm -hmm. I know that it gets attention. I know that it's easy to explain and, and it kind of fits into people's unfortunately, you know, stereotypes, like mm -hmm. you said about uh, black male criminality. But what harm are we doing in the larger sense when we use that type of language? Mm -hmm. um, and I can tell you for sure, because we are involved in the aftermath of things, um, that it impacts uh, survivors' access to justice when we perpetuate just one way of what being a trafficker is. Mm -hmm. And it really, it doesn't, it, it limits survivors' ability to feel like they can identify as a mm -hmm. survivor even. So, um, other myths that we need to address. Um, one, another myth that I hear often is that real victims are going to come forward and report the crime that's been committed <laughs> against them. And I think we've touched on why this is not necessarily true for many reasons, kind of a, we hope everyone understands this, but there are going to be so many barriers to a person coming forward and asking for help, um, you know, fear of ramifications to them, themselves, the people they care about, um, comfort, they don't want to leave someone that's been providing them with some modicum of support, um, as well as just, you know, f fear of law enforcement, fear of the unknown. I mean, what is it going to mean to identify as a survivor or to be under this label of someone who's been subjected to human trafficking? Or if I just don't even know that human trafficking is a thing. Mm -hmm. I remember exactly. one of the first clients I worked with was like, oh, I just thought that was called dating. Yes. yes. <laughs> and I remember that was really shocking to me because it was so far outside of my personal experience. But just and it just it kind of shed light on, well, how am I going to ask for help for something I don't know is happening? Mm hmm. And I think, or is a crime. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we see this too in the labor trafficking world as well, where yeah. people think, well, this situation I was in where I had to work 20 hours a day and I, you know, slept in a room with no bed and I, you know, didn't have any time off and couldn't contact my family and didn't have access to my documents. I thought that was just a normal part of this, you know, the immigrant experience, yeah, the, the, the domestic, you know, yeah. work experience that I was um, you know, having, and they didn't even realize that there was a term like human trafficking to encompass their experience. Um, so I think there's also a, a confusion around the terms human trafficking and human smuggling. Um, you know, human trafficking does not require the movement of a person, but movement can occur. Sometimes when people commonly are trafficked, does commonly, occur. they yeah. are, you know, taken somewhere else. They're often the trafficker will want to isolate them by taking them out of their comfortable surroundings, out of their community, and getting them to a place where they don't know who or how to reach out for help. But this is still different than human smuggling, um, which basically requires movement across an international boundary, like a country's border. So the two are distinct ideas, so they can have some overlap. Right. And I think there, it's also the issue of I can consent to be smuggled, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like I want to mm -hmm. get out of my country. Mm -hmm. I consent to mm -hmm. being smuggled across a border mm -hmm. um, and that can lead to a trafficking situation. Mm -hmm. But trafficking, as we've discussed, is the use of force, fraud, or coercion to compel someone to do something, mm -hmm. some form of labor. Mm -hmm. I can consent to being smuggled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Another myth is that human trafficking must involve forced prostitution. Um, again, we've touched on this a lot, but this just perpetuates this idea that trafficking is really only, you know, cases involving someone who is forced to engage in sex by someone who's a pimp. And that just, it really narrows the view of, of you know, who is having this experience. And it completely cuts out this notion of forced labor, which I think is a problem. But forced prostitution, I think, is what does get the most attention from the advocacy community, from Hollywood, from, you know. <laughs> as gross as it is for me to say this, it's sexier. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that grabs the public's attention a lot more. So we just need to be careful that we're using a wide lens to be sure that we get everyone who's, a survivor the support that they need and you know kind of going back to those the laws that we talked about i suspect that's why we first put trafficking you know trafficking mm -hmm. as part of the prostitution subtitle mm -hmm. there's no labor trafficking mm -hmm. law because this is what people are fixated on yeah and it's kind of astounding in 20 you know 2019 that up until this year we did not have a law against forced labor to explicitly here in maryland so again i think that just goes to what the focus mm -hmm. has been on historically 
Um, and there's also a lot of misconceptions about when and where and how trafficking occurs. Um, I, there's always all this hype around the Super Bowl that that's going to lead to an explosion of human trafficking. Um, and that's just, I don't think there's statistics or data that support that. Um, there's also a lot of uh, talk about what the average age of entry is. And I think this is a, a discussion that often highlights this uh, myth of the age of 12 being the, the, the average age of entry uh, or when somebody is trafficked. And there, again, there just aren't really data, isn't data and statistics to support The data that. doesn't exist and the quote unquote, this bad data actually came from old studies that actually had nothing to do with, with trafficking. Yeah. And they've become something that they're not, like with this 100,000 uh, to 300,000 um, children being trafficked. I mean, that came from a study in 2001 that mm -hmm. the, even the, the, the academics that were involved say that the, the research was crap. Mm -hmm. And it also said specifically in the report, 100,000 to 300,000 children are at risk. And people have just taken that and run with it. And then it's like a game of telephone. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. okay, well, I leave off the at risk. So I talk to you about that and then you reproduce mm -hmm. that information mm -hmm. and then it just gets even worse. Mm -hmm. um, I always tell people, don't talk about data, talk about vulnerability. Exactly. Like we need to improve data, yep. but perpetuating false narratives doesn't help anyone. Mm -hmm. Especially when they're fixated on certain stereotypes that exactly. can potentially exclude a whole populations of people that might be vulnerable Absolutely. and need help. So another myth is that only cisgender women and girls are the victims of human trafficking. And um, as we noted in some of the prior slides, there is actually an increased vulnerability oftentimes for individuals that are not falling into that category, individuals who identify as LGBTQ. We actually do a lot of outreach to the transgender community because again, the intersecting levels of discrimination and, and harassment that um, members of that community can face often put them more at risk of future exploitation. And we should probably just define, um, so cisgender versus transgender. Cisgender refers to someone um, who was assigned uh, who identifies as the gender that they were, uh, the sex that they were assigned at birth. So if someone is assigned female at birth um, and then grows up feeling female, um, mm -hmm. that is somebody who would be referred to as cisgender. Whereas somebody who's transgender, they were the sex that they were assigned at birth is not the gender they identify as um, going forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also, I mean, people overlook that boys and men can be trafficked Absolutely. too. And that's a, a huge problem that I think is getting more attention lately, but you just, you, you don't want to have blinders on when you're screening for potential victims or working with them. And actually the, the Maryland Child Sex Trafficking Conference that's coming up in August, the focus is on uh, uh, male victims. Mm -hmm. So give a little plug to them. <laughs> and... Last but not least, um, there is a myth that all prostitution is trafficking, and this is not the same thing. Um, you know, trafficking occurs if a sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion. People can decide to engage in prostitution mm -hmm. and trading sex for some kind of commercial benefit of their own free will, so it's important to draw distinctions between those two things. All right, so now we're gonna turn to after talking about all the laws <laughs> and the this law heavy yes, ones. Yes, we're gonna to turn to looking a little bit more in depth about what impact an arrest or conviction can have on a survivor of human trafficking um, and how it can really, again, prevent them from moving forward with their life in safety and being able to make the choices that they need to pursue a career or get housing or access anything that, that they need. Yeah. And again, the Human Trafficking Prevention Project started focused on um, survivors who have criminal records. And that's mm -hmm. why we're, we're kind of focused on this. We don't have a ton of time. So mm -hmm. I think we will probably um, go through this on the lighter side. Um, but again, that's why these uh, PowerPoints are available. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we're always available for additional questions if we didn't cover something that is important to you. Mm -hmm. So just thinking generally, what is a collateral consequence? That is the penalty or disqualification that's attached to an arrest or a criminal conviction. There are two different types of that, uh, of collateral consequences. There are collateral sanctions, which are legal penalties imposed automatically upon a person at the time that they were convicted. So if I lose my driver's license through a DUI or I'm banned from possessing a weapon because I have a felony, those are things that happen automatically. 
What's far more problematic um, for survivors are these discretionary disqualifications. And those are legal penalties that a court agency or official is authorized but not required to impose upon someone. Um, one of the most important things to understand is the intersection between having a criminal record and getting housing. Um, housing, I focus on first always because it really is the linchpin for everything else, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. if I don't have a stable place to lay my head at night, I am going to have trouble getting to my appointments. I'm going to have trouble getting legal mail. I'm going to have trouble, you know, all, doing all of those things, washing my clothes so I can be ready for an interview. Mm -hmm. Housing really is the linchpin. Um, and this comes from this one strike eviction policy on the federal level um, that was created by the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988, strengthened by a 96 executive order that essentially says that anybody who um, has that a tenant who is living in public housing can be evicted from that public housing for the criminal activity of a household member, a guest, or a person under the tenant's control that occurs on or off the premises, regardless of whether or not the tenant was aware of the activity <laughs> or, <laughs> or if the activity resulted in a conviction. Essentially what the federal government started to do or did, not didn't start to do, did uh, during the quote unquote war on drugs in the 80s and 90s was make criminal records the kind of linchpin between kicking people out of housing, letting them have housing, letting them access public benefits, thinking that those things would get people off of drugs. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it did the exact and total opposite. Mm -hmm. The war on drugs has been a failure because it has set entire communities up so that they are unemployable, so that they don't have stable housing, they can't access benefits, all of those things. And that's kind of the theme of all of these um, these particular um, slides. So essentially, this is good law, quote unquote. It was upheld by the Supreme Court um, in a case uh, called the Department of Housing and Urban Development versus Rucker. Um, essentially, it was an elderly woman who had a caretaker who had uh, cocaine on their person, and that was used to kick her out of public housing, and that was upheld by the Supreme Court. Um, things have been softened, and you'll find this kind of across the board having to do with housing and public benefits and all of those things, um, but currently we really don't know what's going on uh, in the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, so this slide focuses on retaining housing. This slide focuses on obtaining housing, and essentially what you need to know is that uh, folks who um, are offering housing have wide discretion to set the boundaries of who and who can actually get housing with them. Um, and that results in a lot of discrimination against folks with uh, criminal records. Especially if a survivor has, if they have an arrest for a prostitution on their record, if they have that an arrest an easy for drug way to say I don't arrest want them. for trespass, mm -hmm. which we see Drugs. so frequently, right. um, that is going to oftentimes mean they just simply cannot access housing. Okay. Um, we wanna go through these slides a little quick. Sure. Okay. So go ahead if you want to. Yeah, so there's there's definitely a lot of impact on um, a person's ability to get employment, and especially if they are looking for a job where they need some kind of licensing um, if they have a criminal record. Um, as you could see from the slide, most employers are going to be running background checks, mm -hmm. and that having some kind of criminal record, even if it's just arrest, doesn't even need to be a conviction, right. reduces that callback rate significantly by over 50%, and it can limit earning potential in the future. Um, and so many adults confront barriers in securing employment. Um, and it's interesting because there's, what is it, 16, over 16,000 <laughs> Almost laws, 17, <laughs> yeah. laws in this, in this country um, that look at criminal records um, and that will limit people who can apply for certain occupations to certain occupations based on having a criminal record. And it's it's important to note that oftentimes some of the things that are most heavily licensed are in fields like healthcare, education, places where survivors of human trafficking might be interested in working. Um, and oftentimes places where women are, are mm -hmm. drawn to and looking for Female jobs. Female identified folks. Female yeah. identified folks, exactly. And they're barred from even applying for these types of jobs mm -hmm. or you know dreaming of these types of jobs because of the criminal record. And oftentimes, 
um, with these occupational licensing requirements, um, agencies can look past things too, like expungement um, or, mm -hmm. or shielding to see if a record is there. So that's something that, again, as we move forward with this webinar series, we'll look to address um, and talk about some of the benefits of right. different forms of criminal record relief. So very briefly, uh, in terms of public benefits, again, um, an attempt to get people off of drugs and to curb uh, the impact of drug um, use in communities was to simply say that you can no longer get public benefits if you have <laughs> convictions on your record. And that came about through uh, a law in 1996 called the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, which is an incredibly judgmental name for a law, <laughs> um, that put a lifetime ban on receiving public benefits through TANF, which is temporary uh, assistance for needy families, and SNAP, which is food uh, stamp benefits for drug-related felonies. So folks are getting locked up for, for using drugs, and then their penalty is that you can no longer take care of yourselves or your children, which doesn't make much sense to me. Um, luckily, the states were given the option of waiving and moder modifying the bans, which has happened, but it hasn't happened throughout the entire country. Um, as you can see, there are several that still have those full SNAP and TANF bans. Um, and then it's worth noting for folks who are um, kind of regularly intersecting with the criminal legal system, having those ongoing criminal justice issues um, can impact you remaining ineligible for these type of benefits. Um, so generally speaking, these are uh, problematic in terms of uh, female identified persons. 85.7% of adult uh, welfare recipients are women. Obviously, that then trickles down to the kids, because mm -hmm. if I am banned from getting benefits, that my child will never be. But now mm -hmm. we have to take care of both of us on one person's TANF benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously, this correlates to communities of color that are exceptionally over-policed, um, as well as uh, other communities that were impacted by the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. okay. Federal student loans, generally speaking, again, focused on drug offenses. Um, and this is still good law. So if you have a state or a federal conviction, a misdemeanor or a felony for possession or distribution, your eligibility for receiving student loan aid may be suspended if you're convicted of a drug offense. Um, the Department of Education has definitely applied this ban more broadly. Um, but generally speaking, I hope you're starting to see a, you know, a pattern here is that once somebody is, has intersected with the criminal legal system, their housing is impacted, their public benefits are impacted, their ability to pursue an education is impacted. Mm -hmm. Also, their, um, their, the, the stability of their family um, has been impacted by this. You see the numbers uh, in 2007, approximately 1.7 million children had a parent in prison. Um, and because of the war on drugs, there was an 80% increase in incarceration of persons who have children. Uh, a lot of people don't know that the uh, increase among uh, women uh, being incarcerated was even higher than it was for men. There was a 122% increase. Um, and at this point, nearly half of all US children have at least one parent with a criminal record. Um, having a criminal record impacts child support. So if somebody is actually incarcerated prior to 2017, you were considered voluntarily unemployed. And you're still when liable for you, you were, yeah, Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so you emerge with these tremendous arrears or tremendous mm -hmm. amount of money um, that was um, actually due, and that impacts stability, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, we say that there's a two generation barrier to stability, education, housing, and family strength. Um, parental incarceration is traumatic. It significantly exacerbates childhood poverty. And then we're talking about then producing more kids that are being vulnerable, that are vulnerable to being trafficked. Um, and then just merely having a criminal record factors into the best interest standard for purposes of child custody and visitation. I can't tell you how many of, of uh, the clients that I've worked with have had their access to their children impacted by the fact that they had a criminal record. Mm -hmm. Okay. Immigration, I think we can skip this particular slide since we're going to have a webinar. Yeah, we'll have a on webinar and go more in depth. Just know that there are definite, you know, consequences if you do not have right. stable status to having arrests or convictions. Right. And it can be it can compound a situation that a human trafficking survivor faces if they don't have that stable status. Right. Um, it also uh, impacts your ability to participate in our democracy. There uh, are links between voting and criminal records. Um, that unfortunately 
uh, there's a, a push to kind of reinstate these in a, in a lot of states. You can um, read the small forward. print. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. at another point. But it, it's, it's interesting to see how, again, there's wild swings between yeah. how uh, having a criminal record will impact your ability to vote. Yes, exactly. All right, so the last part of our presentation, in the last two minutes of our presentation, we're going to talk about why criminal record relief is so important for survivors of trafficking. Um, it's really important to, under, to remember that human trafficking victims are often convicted for acts over which they had no control mm -hmm. um, and that they are rarely identified as such at the time of arrest and prosecution. Now, we do have data that actually bears that out. Mm -hmm. um, in 2016, there was a National Survivor Network survey that determined that 91 percent of the survivors that are a part of the network had been arrested. I mean, mm -hmm. that is a remarkable number. And these are human trafficking survivors. And this is when, right. we, when we reflect on all the things we just told you about lack of access to housing, hurdles to getting employment, not being able to access benefits, family law complications, like mm -hmm. it all goes back to this idea that almost all of the survivors that were talked to during the right. survey are impacted by they all had of that been arrested right because it doesn't just magically your record doesn't automatically magically disappear when you've been identified as a human trafficking right. survivor you have to take legal steps mm -hmm. to try and address that record right so within that 91 percent 42 percent reported arrests as minors remember we talked about that mm -hmm. um you know the the difference between federal and state laws right um over 50 percent of respondents reported that every single arrest on their criminal record was trafficking related we're talking about an literally an epidemic among this population mm -hmm. over 40 percent arrested nine times or more and then the myth that only pro only prostitution is a is an is an issue among um, survivors with criminal records. Sixty percent reported for being arrested for crimes other than prostitution. Um, and then you talked about during the mist that people will come forward and report mm -hmm. the crime against them. Well, no, eighty percent of these individuals reported that they did not disclose at the time of their arrest because they were scared because they were being threatened, or simply because nobody bothered to ask. Mm -hmm. So again, all these collateral consequences we discussed, they directly impact survivors right. of human trafficking. And that's something that we need to try to mm -hmm. address through post-conviction relief. Right. Um, I think one of the most compelling reasons why post-conviction relief is so important for survivors is that it's directly in conflict with federal law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the exactly. DVPA was like way ahead of its time, mm -hmm. actually, when it said that victims of severe forms of trafficking should not be inappropriately incarcerated, fined, or otherwise penalized solely for unlawful acts committed as a direct result of being trafficked. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, it was focused more on kind of thinking about um, challenges involving immigration, mm -hmm. but we've obviously expanded our knowledge mm -hmm. of that. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's really important to understand that arresting and incarcerating survivors is contrary to federal law. And then you have to just compare that to that slide we just looked at, which shows that this is just not the reality, unfortunately, that most survivors right. experience. Like they are having, it is not uncommon for us to work with people that have many convictions or arrests on their record. And again, for a wide variety of things that some can be addressed through mm -hmm. Expungement, some can be addressed through vacature, but oftentimes you have to be creative. <laughs> mm -hmm. and we will have uh, further um, uh, webinars on that. Um, <laughs> this is a, um, a quote from a, a survivor of sex trafficking who was born in the United States. And she said, I always felt like a criminal. I never felt like a victim at all. Victims don't do time in jail. They work on the healing process. I was a criminal because I spent time in jail. And, and you know, this quote really kind of sums up why we started the Human Trafficking Prevention Project, because this is unjust. Mm -hmm. This is the opposite of justice. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line really is that a criminal record keeps survivors trapped in the very industries that we all as advocates want them to be able to get out of, mm -hmm. uh, prevents them from healing. And then as Heather has highlighted, and we've highlighted a million and one times, makes them vulnerable to being re-victimized. Mm -hmm underground economy is always there there's always people looking to exploit other always. people and again if we have these barriers that are put up and and facing survivors it makes it very hard right. to move forward and if i can just plug one last thing again um if you're doing anti-trafficking work you gotta get involved and be concerned about the criminal legal system mm -hmm. because it is 
um, one of the biggest actors in the lives of your clients. Mm -hmm. And if it's kind of like, well, that's only for criminals, mm -hmm. then you're really not, it's not a holistic way to look at this work. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Only we, three minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we flew through a few of those slides at the end, but like I said, the, um, the, webinar will be up for your reference and you can download the slides from this presentation. Um, there is a link available in GoToWebinar that you should see on your dashboard. We'll also be sending out a post-webinar survey. We would love to hear what you think. Thank you so much so that we can improve as we continue to offer this series, um, both looking at some of the basics around human trafficking and uh, relief that's available to survivors when they have criminal record issues, as well as some interesting intersecting issues. Um, uh, our last webinar focused on human trafficking and tax, and our next one upcoming will look at human trafficking and immigration, and then we look forward to offering you a new webinar every quarter going forward <laughs> for the indefinite yeah. future. Um, just so you know, there are ways that you can get involved in this work as well. Um, you know, MVLS does have a wide volunteer network that really supports um, the work of the Human Trafficking Prevention Project and lets us connect survivors with help with criminal record relief and with a host of other civil legal issues that they are often struggling with. So if you're an attorney that's listening today, please go visit MVLS's website and sign up for more information about how you can volunteer with the organization, um, assist individuals through this project, and get trained on some different areas of law that you might not be familiar with. Um, there's also a lot of resources available on our website. You can go look under attorney resources to the pro bono portal to see what kind of cases we have available, and also to access things like trainings, webinars, fact sheets, and other guidance from the organization. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of the pro bono portal. Um, and we do have some upcoming trainings that I wanted to highlight. Um, there's a tax training coming up on July 11th. Um, there's a regular tax series that we do um, through our low income taxpayer clinic um, that looks at a lot of interesting topics related to um, assisting individuals that are facing tax controversies. And then on August 7th, we are going to have the second and this series of webinars where we're going to be looking at how you actually file for a vacature of prostitution convictions in Maryland. And we'll be diving a little bit more in depth about that form of relief that's available to trafficking survivors, um, walking through the process, um, and uh, also explaining, I think, too, how advocates can support attorneys and yes. clients that are um, engaged in this process, because mm -hmm. it is one that's a little bit more involved than, say, just filing a petition for expungement. Um, here's our contact information. You can, of course, feel free to reach out to Jess or myself at any time. If you have clients you want to refer, questions about this issue, um, if we can provide other forms of support. Thank you so much, and we will see you next time. Thank you.